You're listening to People Powered Media here on Philly Cam Radio on WPPM LP in Philadelphia. Stay tuned for the People Powered Lunch Hour. Hello, and welcome to the People Power Lunch Hour Show. Live on Philly Cam TV and WPPM 106.5 FM. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graver, and on today's show, we're going to talk with some folks from the Alzheimer's Association here in Philadelphia. They're going to talk about what Alzheimer's disease is, what the risk factors are, and also what the treatment options are. We'll have Frederica Wall, Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and Cynthia Solis, Latino Outreach Coordinator, speaking with us today in the studio. The People Power Lunch Hour is a weekly program that we produce here at Philicam that's meant to engage our citizens in meaningful discussion about social issues, local organizing, and nonprofit organization initiatives. We'll have all that and more on this edition of the People Power Lunch Hour. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to the People Power Lunch Hour. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. And on today's show, we're going to be speaking about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we have representatives from the Delaware Valley chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I'm joined in the studio by my two lovely guests, Frederica Wall, who's the Associate Director of Diversity Inclusion, and Cynthia Solis, who is the Latino Outreach Coordinator. Uh, we are going to be talking about their programs and services and some new information that has been released through research that's been conducted on Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's Association uh, Delaware Valley Chapter serves southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey, and Delaware, and it's a local chapter of the National Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Association. They, their mission is to eliminate Alzheimer's disease through the advancement of research, to provide and enhance care and support for all affected, and to reduce the risk of dementia through the promotion of brain health. They engage families through education, advocacy, and support. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, before we begin and get into a discussion about all of the great things that your organization has to offer, mm -hmm. can you tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit more about what is Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Okay, well, first of all, Alzheimer's disease is not a normal part of aging. It is a, a progressive brain disease and sometimes confused with a mental health issue because some of the behaviors um, have people thinking that this is a mental health issue. But it's actually a brain disease. And unfortunately, the, the brain is being destroyed. And so that's why a lot of the behaviors come about. Um, there's what they call this amyloid protein plaque that gets in the brain and there's some theories that say you have a little bit of it and then it starts to grow and then there are other theorists who say no you don't have any but the unfortunate thing is they don't know how or why it gets into the brain but then it destroys the neurons in all of this, the uh, lobes of our brain and that's what creates the behavior and so people lose their ability to um, form new memories, they lose their ability to talk, they eventually lose their ability to walk, but it's the uh, loss of memory that is most significant and the thing that most people understand about Alzheimer's disease. So we're talking about older people, but there's different groups of older people. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe the, the age groups that we're talking about because they're affected a little bit differently? 
Yes. Um, well, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, age is a factor, is a risk factor, and usually we're thinking of people 65 and older. However, um, there are approximately 200,000 to 400,000 people who are under the age of 65. Average age is like maybe in their 50s uh, who will get this disease. And then you have people over 90 years old as well? Yes, yes, yes of course. There are people over 90, and that's part of the, one of the new research um, outcomes is that um, with people living longer, of course, but whatever happens at a younger age, or the younger older, as they're calling it, mm -hmm. also it continues with the oldest older, and that's the 90-year-old and above, and 90 to 100 to 105, whatever happens. So tell us a little bit about the work that each of you do. You work with diversity and inclusion. You're doing Latino outreach. Yes. Of course, our city is mostly black and Latino. So tell us a little bit about your department and tell us about the outreach that you do. Well, the department is set up, of course, and Cynthia is definitely part of the department. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have um, faith outreach in our department. Uh, we also work with the LGBT community. And so, you know, it's it's education on both sides. We get education from the community and we give education to the community. And um, Cynthia is relatively new to our staff but comes with some with a lot of background and a lot of good information. And so I'm gonna let you let yeah, her tell so you what she does. As being the Latino outreach coordinator, so I have many responsibilities. One of them are primarily responsible to conduct and do educational programs in the community and um, to raise awareness, um, provide Alzheimer's and dementia um, education and support to people with dementia and families, caregivers. Um, and this, these educational programs are done in Spanish. And I'm based in the Philadelphia chapter here yeah. in Philadelphia. Because yeah. so many people don't have access to bilingual information. Mm -hmm. A lot of the information that's put out there is mm -hmm. English only. Right. So. Yes. Right. So um, we have a lot of like, literature and materials that I hand out and are in Spanish. So it's great because we're targeting that population and mm -hmm. we're giving them the right information in their native tongue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Well, what we're hearing is that uh, usually a person will go to the doctor when they are having uh, difficulty me remembering things, and or their family will notice that they're having a lot of memory loss. But what we understand now is that it, the disease may have started even five, ten years before that. But uh, the hallmark is the fact of memory loss. And then, you know, you're looking at people who then um, may be forgetting things, may be repeating things over and over again, the same story, uh, that type of information. And um, you're looking at people who are having a hard time learning anything new. And also they tend to have, uh, I guess, behaviors. They get agitated. Mm -hmm they may tend to wander. Um, so they have, they suffer from many, um, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. so. Right, I mean even as far as their vision, vision is, becomes impaired and they don't see the depth, you know, like we see when you're looking at steps, you see a depth where you put your foot, well they don't see that depth anymore. So um, when people refuse to do certain things like go up or down stairs, um, if the caregiver is not aware, then it may be because they don't see the stairs the same way. So a lot of times there's a lot of, of um, aggravation on the part of even the caregiver because he or she doesn't realize why these behaviors are happening. And it's, you know, they think that the person's just being obstinate when it's really because things are really changing in their brain and they can't see something or they don't recognize something or they are unable to control certain things anymore. Do you find that it's often uh, family members or spouses that are the people who start to notice and report these behaviors? Or is it the person themselves that starts to realize that things aren't right? Um, it could be both. Um, a lot of the times they start uh, feeling, oh, not themselves mm -hmm. and sometimes they may share that information with their loved ones but a lot of the times they don't mm 
Mm -hmm. um, it is a progressive disease. Um, so they, in their mind, they don't know what's going on mm -hmm. in their bodies. Mm -hmm. So it takes a family member to kind of recognize these behaviors mm -hmm. and yes. the signs and symptoms. Yeah, usually it is, like Cynthia said, it's a family member, friends, you know, and then a lot of times people are in denial on both sides. You have the person with the disease who says, there's nothing wrong with me. And you also will have even the family members saying, you know, mom is fine. My wife is fine. There's nothing wrong with her. So they, it, it becomes very difficult then for caregiving to, to be uh, set up in a reasonable way. And if the person is denying that they have any problems at all, it makes it difficult for caregiving. But some, most of the time that denial is because they're really fighting really hard to be the person that they have been in the past. You know, they know there's something wrong, but they really don't want it to be wrong. And of course that's understandable. That's why we uh, recommend to go to your doctor regularly and get a diagnosis if you are experiencing some symptoms or you're not feeling yourself. So have a good communication with your doctor and get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And how is it diagnosed? Is there a test that they take? Yes, there's a series of tests. Um, they, a doctor, a physician will uh, do a thorough medical history. Um, they would check your mental status and your, um, test your moods. They will also do a physical exam and a neurological exam, and they do blood testing. So it's not a one-time visit. It's a, a few visit, doctor visits, and there are a few doctors that diagnose, um, neurologists and geriatricians. Mm -hmm. yeah. The process can be, as Cynthia said, it can be long. It can be an hour. And, uh, but when you go to a doctor, I, I usually, so one of my pet peeves is, you go to your doctor and he or she, you know, in the, in the middle of your conversation of telling them that you're suffering from great memory loss, mm -hmm. they all of a sudden write you a prescription, say for Aricep. That to me is not a very good diagnosis. You deserve to have a thorough diagnosis, like C Cynthia said, with blood work and all of those things, so that you're sure, because it could be something else and you want to be sure of what it is. And so, you know, then there'll be like a second or third visit for the doctor to explain to you the outcome of the testing. Like many other health problems could, um, could show the same kind of symptoms of dementia. Mm -hmm. Let's say maybe if you have, if you're suffering from depression, maybe it could be a drug interaction, it, you could have a thyroid problem, mm -hmm. um, excess use of alcohol, or you could even have some vi vitamin deficiencies, such mm -hmm. as vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. So people shouldn't panic. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. Displaying some of these symptoms exactly. it, it could be something else. Yeah. Do you think there's stigma within the African American and Latino community? Um, not so much with just Alzheimer's, but in general, when, when people start to have some of these issues that are affecting their mental health? Oh, sure. There's always been a stigma with Alzheimer's. And it's because, you know, many, many, many years ago, it was called being senile. You know, uh, grandmother got old and she was just old and senile. But it was since 1906, which is when Alois Alzheimer um, sort of discovered this disease, it obviously was named after him. But so it's been around a long time with a, with a diagnosis and all. But now it's um, people just didn't want anyone to know because again, a lot of the behaviors look like mental illness. And of course, we know how difficult it is for people to accept mental illness. So it's had. A, big stigma in that way. And some people still don't want anyone to know. It even goes so far as it's not on the death certificate. If the family doesn't want it on the death certificate, then it's not on the death certificate. Would it be listed as like natural causes then? Sometimes it is, or it's sometimes it's uh, from died from de pneumonia, or they may say complications of dementia, but they will not necessarily say dementia or Alzheimer's dementia. Same, um, same fears, I would say, with the Hispanic community. Um, having that fear or belief that you're gonna get dementia or Alzheimer's um, increases your stress level. Mm -hmm. So even with that is a risk in itself mm -hmm. to get the disease. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, like the Latino population, already suffers from type two diabetes, um, obesity, hypertension, and that's placing them in a higher risk for dementia. Definitely. 
And how do you say Alzheimer's in Espanol? <laughs> Is it the Alzheimer. same? Alzheimer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's something you don't hear very often. So mm -hmm. even just letting people know that this is yeah. a condition yeah. as part of the work. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned risk factors. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about more of, of some of these risk factors? Because some really important research was just released mm -hmm. um, that talked about a disparity um, within the African American and Latino community about their risk factors mm -hmm. contributing to their probability of, of, of having Alzheimer's or dementia. Right. Well, there was several things. This, of course, is coming out of the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, which was just recently held in London. And so there were, you know, several thousand, at least 2,000 or more researchers there uh, bringing their research from all over the world to talk about Alzheimer's disease and different other dementias also. Alzheimer's is the most common of the dementias, but there are lots of other dementias. And so one of the studies looked at uh, a single major stressful life event and how that could equal four years of cognitive aging. And the fact that African Americans are very much at risk on average for uh, that, if the experience um, over 60% more of such events than, than the, our white counterparts. So, you know, stressful events, of course, could be anything, and, and if the stressful event is in early life, um, for instance, in the city of Philadelphia, it could be the fact that you saw someone shot and killed, that type of stressful event, or maybe you um, were, were abused, or maybe you're living uh, near uh, drug abusing people, those kinds of things. So with those very stressful events in early life, that's going to add four years of cognitive aging to a person. And so um, they, in doing this research, this is coming out of Wisconsin, they found that African Americans had the highest percentage uh, to be at risk for this type of um, stress, and which would be, they're not saying it causes Alzheimer's, but it does put people more at risk. There's a relationship there. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, for the Hispanic community, I would say um, not knowing what resources are out there and accessing, having access to health care. So that could be a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Also, the language barrier, you know, if they don't speak the language. You know, Spanish is the second most spoken language in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why it's good um, in cre creating awareness, mm -hmm. you know, and reaching out to those Hispanic communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know, you know, from previous People Power Lunch Hour shows mm -hmm. that people in Philadelphia mm -hmm. who are African American or Latino mm -hmm. are more likely to be arrested, incarcerated, mm -hmm. um, foreclosed upon, mm -hmm. evicted, yeah. um, suffer domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of um, stressful yeah. Yeah, like events. losing a job, mm -hmm. having right. a child pass away or... Right. Yeah, those are all very stressful mm -hmm. events, and that r truly increases your chances mm -hmm. because so it creates inflammation in your brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the more traumatic events you have or stressful yes. events, yes. or maybe it's one event but stressful over a long period yeah, of definitely. time. Definitely. And that could also manifest later. If a person does get dementia, it can manifest in more agitation, more be aggressive behaviors. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. There were environmental factors as well. Yes, the environment as far as um, people living in uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods mm -hmm. or disadvantaged mm -hmm. areas. There was also the uh, fact of living in a state where the infant mortality is, is high. Mm -hmm. And they found that um, African Americans and Latinos who live in states where the mortality is high, they seem to be more at risk for dementia. And so, and they, they also looked at the fact that if people move, then the, the, uh, the, pr the risk does decrease. Um, so it's, it's important to consider, you know, where people live. Uh, we have a helpline, which is 24-7, and so we need to understand these things so that when we're talking to people, um, we don't necessarily need to share the research information with them, but we need to be aware 
that this person could be living in a disadvantaged neighborhood. And so some of the things that we might think they need to do, or we don't understand why they're not doing them, could be because of where they live. They may not be eating healthy foods because maybe the, uh, there are no large supermarkets nearby. Uh, so there could be lots of things that um, are going on, and again, go back to the stressful events. Um, and since you already mentioned that, in the African American and Latino community, we have a high incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, and um, high cholesterol, obesity, mm -hmm. and all of these things put people more at risk for dementia because they all have something to do with our blood flow. Yes, the Hispanic community is one and a half times more likely to get um, dementia, form of dementia. Mm -hmm. So we do um, a lot of preventative things um, that reduce that risk, such as man maintaining a healthy weight, um, having formal education, so continue learning things. Mm -hmm. um, take a class online or go to class on, um, at a college. Um, you, if you smoke, quit smoking, and that will reduce uh, the risk. Mm -hmm. So if you take care of your heart, you're also taking care of your brain. Mm -hmm. um, if you have high blood pressure, reduce those levels. Um, manage your diabetes. Um, the typical eat a balanced diet. Higher in fru fruits and vegetables, such as a Mediterranean diet. Um, you you got to take care of your mental health also. So if you suffer from uh, depression, seek treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so challenge your mind, play memory games, do puzzles, um, and also engage in regular cardiovascular exercise. And that brings in blood flow to your brain and that's gonna um, help you to reduce the risk for cognitive mm -hmm. decline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the reality is most people are not gonna be able to move from their poor or disadvantaged yes, neighborhood. Correct or get out of their stressful situation, mm -hmm. but you can do things to take care of your body yes. and oh, maybe not eliminate all the risks, but reduce them. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, that's very true because like you said, people may not be able to get out of their neighborhood or move or whatever. So uh, because in a lot of neighborhoods, there's not even a safe place for people to exercise. So people really mm -hmm. do have to find ways to make their health better, to improve their health and to be healthy, uh, taking walks, and if it's not safe for you to take a walk at a certain time of day, then uh, hopefully you can figure out what time of day is better for you to take a walk in your neighborhood, walk with somebody, you know, that kind of thing, because walking um, is a very good exercise, and it's not anything that you have to, you know, buy a lot of equipment for or anything. And by doing all this, you're reducing a third of your risk already, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, is there a relationship between, um, you know, if your parents or another family member have it, um, is it hereditary, I guess? It's not considered hereditary uh, because it doesn't follow in every family. However, there are a very, very, very small group of families where it does, and that's called familiar uh, dementia. So that means that in, those, in that family, they do have the gene, which is the APOE4 gene, and so that gene will, when discovered, will say that, yes, you have the gene, however, you may or may not have Alzheimer's. But in the case of those families where it is followed uh, from one generation to another, they have the gene and it, it, it continues from one family to the other. But there are approximately maybe like 200 cases uh, of, of those types of families where they have a familial dementia. And so it's, um, it is very, very rare. But people do ask that question. I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even if no one in your family has had it before, that doesn't mean that you won't um, you know, be exposed to it. Exactly. So exactly. if you have that a particular gene, you may or may not get it mm -hmm. also. I know. That's why it makes so it, it so guarantee. Right. That's why it makes it so hard for our researchers to come up with a way to prevent it or to cure it because every step of the way there's some kind of barrier or something that prevents them from coming up with the magic pill. Uh, so there are a lot of risk factors and that's what they're working on as far as if we can lower the risk factors perhaps we can lower the incidences of people having this form of dementia, but it's, it's just very, very difficult because as Cynthia said, you can have the gene and still not have the disease. 
Right, and you're not just lowering your risk of dementia or Alzheimer's, but all of these other mm -hmm. things too, mm -hmm. right? They're all kind of related. If you have a poor diet mm -hmm. and you don't exercise and you have a lot of stress, right. um, you could wind up with one or many of these conditions. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, do you see a lot of people who have both then, you know, Alzheimer's and diabetes? Or oh, Alzheimer's? yes. Yes, a lot of African Americans do have high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, when I go to do a presentation, I usually ask people, you know, to kind of raise their hand, nod their head or something, uh, because they are putting themselves at risk. Uh, and it depends on, sometimes I don't ask people because I don't want to make them uncomfortable, but yes, people who currently have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, uh, problem with their weight, uh, they definitely need to talk to their doctor uh, figure out how can I lower the numbers and it is possible in most cases uh, to lower those numbers. How long has your organization been around doing this work? Oh at least 30 years, 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. And where are you headquartered? The Dolor Valley chapter is, is one of many. Yes. We are on uh, 399, 399 Market Street here mm -hmm. in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and um, our national yeah. headquarters is in Chicago. And we are now a, a national organization, uh, although there are still many chapters, but we are a national organization and we are growing in that. That's a, a kind of a new position for us to be in as far as starting this past January. So we are now in regions and um, we happen to be in region 13 and we'll be coming together in a few days, about a week from now. Uh, but it's, been, it's very exciting. Uh, because now we're all, on, as they say, all on the same page, yes. and um, all of, we will look very much the same, doing the same thing across the United States and um, even as far as Puerto Rico, Canada. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a short break. If you've just joined us, we've been speaking with representatives from the Delaware Valley chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I'm here with Frederica Wall, who's mm -hmm. the Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and Cynthia Solis, who's their Latino Outreach Coordinator. We've been talking about some of the risk factors and prevention measures that people can take um, in regards to Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, in the second half of the show, we'll talk more about their work and some of the specific programs and services that are offered through this nonprofit organization. Uh, stay tuned, we'll be right back. <music>
Hello, welcome back to the People Powered Lunch Hour. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're broadcasting live from Philly Cam Studios here in Center City on our cable channels on Comcast and Verizon, and also on WPPM 106.5 FM. Today we've been speaking with members from the Delaware Valley chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I'm joined by Frederica Wall, who is the Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and Cynthia Solis, who is their Latino Outreach Coordinator. We've been speaking about some of the risk factors and prevention measures that people can take when it comes to Alzheimer's and dementia. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the services that um, your organization offers and also some of the work that you do with caregivers. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia, can you tell us um, who are caregivers, what do they do, and what is your relationship to them in regards to this work? Yes, well, with the increased number of people um, di getting diagnosed with dementia, it also caregivers uh, growth increases. So a lot of these caregivers are spouses, partners, um, sons, daughters. Um, these are mainly the caregiving, mm -hmm. the caregivers. Mm -hmm. So the person who has the relationship with the person suffering yes. from Alzheimer's or dementia, helping them get around, mm -hmm. giving them their medication, mm -hmm. yes. taking them to the doctor right. visits. And yeah. this, uh, the, those are examples of primary caregivers, um, but it's a whole family ordeal. You know, everybody um, can pitch in and be a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the times they, they tend to want their um, loved ones to be at home. So it affects the child just as the same as a mother, daughter, mm -hmm. caregiving for mm -hmm. somebody. It's very expensive and it's very uh, difficult emotionally on people because many people will quit their jobs in order to take care of their mother or their father and um, so and and money just goes because if you think about the fact that you're taking care of not only yourself but another human being who needs medications and who needs a lot of different things uh, so if you are not working uh, then hopefully you know you're living um, on some either your uh, retirement money or something of that sort depending on your age maybe it's Social Security but it's very very expensive uh, to do this and so uh, if you look at that uh, there's a story about a young man who started he decided he was going to take care of his grandfather and they both ended up in poverty the, the poverty the grandfather before he died uh, he was then offered um, some money through the county in which he lived but uh, by that time they had both they just had no money uh, of course this story has a better outcome for the grandson because he has a college degree now and he is directing a program where he is. But it's just so, so expensive. I mean, it's um, two, three hundred dollars a day if you're living in a, um, you know, an assisted living. Uh, and people just don't have that, that kind of money. So a lot of assistance is needed, uh, not only from the county, which is the first place that most people would go, is their county. Every county has an area agency on aging and so that um, county office is where people should start uh, but if your income is even just a few pennies over what the income should be then you're not going to be qualified so that means that you're going to have to pitch in and pay for some of those things but um, if you are qualified then it, it does help there will still be some expenses on your side but you will have some of the things covered um, that's really good to note because, you know, a lot of people who whose parents, you know, like one of the risk factors mm -hmm. is being poor and living in a dysfunctional neighborhood, mm -hmm. so then they're not able to go into a nursing home or a high-priced right. assisted living right. community. Exactly. Um, so oftentimes it is the family members taking on that responsibility, right. which right. in a way is good. You know, a lot of people want their families at home. They don't mm -hmm. want to send them off to right. some place where they might be mistreated, mm -hmm. but it can be very taxing and stressful it, it for is. them. It is the most difficult job that anyone will ever have in their life is to be a caregiver for somebody who has dementia. It is very, very, very stressful. And there is the, uh, anecdotally, they're saying that 40% of the caregivers die before the person who has the disease. 
That's wow, a very yes. high percentage, but it is a very difficult job. One of our few programs, um, which is a great uh, thing that we have, is a 24-7 helpline, and the number is 800-272-3900, where if you call us for support, um, we can provide a listing of home health, local home health agencies um, in your area that can provide services for your loved one. Mm -hmm. So many people don't know that they might even be qualified for a state programs right. that provide like home health aid or nurse. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. And that's why I think they really need to call their county office. Uh, in Philadelphia, that would be the Philadelphia Corporation on Aging. And they would call them and they can get that number from us or they can simply you know, go online. But they should call them first to find out if they do qualify. Uh, because they may not qualify right now, but unfortunately as time goes on and um, they are spending a lot of money to care for this person, uh, maybe they will qualify at a later time. Medicare will do a little bit, but not that much. And so when people do qualify, uh, it's usually Medicaid that will then step in and help with the uh, expenses of this disease. Are there any other resources that your organization offers to either caregivers, families, or people that might be suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's? Well, yes, as Cynthia said, the biggest thing is our 24-7 helpline. You can call any time of day or night, and you'll get a live person to talk to. And that's where you would start. Uh, we do provide a lot of information as far as um, even uh, elder law attorneys. We have a list of those. We do talk to people about different types of things that they can consider, whether it's going to be long-term or short-term, in-home or um, taking someone to a, an adult day center uh, during the day. So we can talk to them about all of that. We also are there just sometimes to listen to caregivers especially because they're going through a lot and they just need to talk it over with someone. So we're there for that. But we also have lots of other programs uh, that we offer uh, through our, just through our office, of course, through the helpline. But um, we offer care consultation where people can, um, Families usually want this because they want to sit down, they mm -hmm. want to talk to someone just about what are they, can they expect. And we can, they do a care plan with a, a social worker and um, there is a fee for that. Usually there is a fee and there are different ways of doing that. You can do it in the home where the, the, the uh, social worker would go to the person's home or uh, you can do it in our office where you would come to the office and have someone talk to you there. Uh, we, we also offer early stage um, initiative where they, um, people with suffering from dementia meet together to socialize, share, you know, experiences. Um, we also, with the, within the early stage, there's also memory cafes where um, it's for them to get together and their partners and just, it's a safe space for them to open up to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's interested in that, of course, can call our 800 number and um, ask for David Johnson, and David would be glad to talk to them about our rec program and our memory cafes, and he's excellent in that area. I think I need to go to that memory cafe. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, you know, everyone can stand to do some of these exercises, mm -hmm. and it's never really too early, right, to yeah, not at all. start exercising your brain in that way. Definitely, exercising your brain, and just, you know, being able to talk uh, with the rec program. It's not about talking or teaching them about the disease. It's about them doing lots of little, lots of lovely things that they can do, sometimes even going out, you know, taking people to the museum or, or to a program of a different sort so they can be out together and not be concerned about the fact that they have Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's um, Association also engages in public advocacy, public mm -hmm. policy work. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk more about some of the things that you are advocating for? Well, yes, we do a lot of advocating, and um, with Katie Macklin at the head of that for us, we go out uh, to visit our local uh, representatives, and we talk to them. We let them know what's going on, but mainly we ask our government for money for research. Uh, we recently uh, was awarded the $400 uh, million for uh, research, and now we're asking them for 414. Uh, we look at overall 
uh, how research monies are appropriated and where they go. And so we have asked to look at over a number of years uh, reaching two billion because we know that that's what it's going to take to find um, prevention or to find a cure for this disease. So right now we are at, I believe it's 1.2 uh, million or actually 1.2 billion, I think it is we're at. So we're, but we continue to ask because, and this money goes to the National Institute of Health. It does not come to the Alzheimer's Association. It goes to the National Institute of Health for research. And so it is very, very important and critical. And most of the money that we raise through our walks and different things will be going for research. Because there's no cure yet. Right, that's right, that's right. And so um, oftentimes when this money is allocated from the federal budget, mm -hmm. then they release grants to universities and other research institutions. That's correct. Where yes. some of this new research has exactly, come Exactly, exactly. And most of our major um, hospitals and universities in our area right here are doing research on Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. since there's a high risk population here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, are there other things you advocate for besides money? <laughs> well, we do advocate for, for education. Uh, we do understand and know that people working in the field need to be educated. For instance, if you're going to talk to a home health agency, you want to be sure that they're educated in dementia care. So we do advocate for this to become part of sort of like a law or a policy that all people working in the mm -hmm. field are educated in dementia care. And that is done under our um, diversity and inclusion department where we're, we belong to. Mm -hmm. And um, we go out to adult daycares, we educate um, staff members mm -hmm. at nursing facilities, um, pretty much mm -hmm. everybody, because uh -huh. this disease affects everybody. Mm -hmm. And we also offer support groups we have over 180 support groups and faith-based um, right. that help with coping Alzheimer's or dementia. Yeah, support groups are critical too for caregivers. Uh, it's very important that they understand that there is some place that they can go and talk to people who are dealing with the same issues. Our support groups, of course, are free. Uh, they usually meet once a month for anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours. Um, and Cynthia did mention our faith-based initiatives. We have quite a few of those where we find that going into different um, religious organizations, churches, mosques, uh, synagogues, and talking about this disease, uh, not only with the leadership, but then the leadership will allow us to talk with the congregation. And we find that's a very good way for us to get the information out. And our faith-based initiatives are done through uh, Reverend Barbara Jones in our office. And so we really uh, appreciate uh, the fact that the faith-based community is open more and more and more for us to come in and to talk about this disease. And this is great for me because a lot of the Hispanic community is very involved within their culture. Mm -hmm. So they go to their church, you know. So that is one of my goals to reach out to um, the local churches. Yeah, because when you're doing outreach, it's just like, it's like how do you find the people? And you have to go to where they're at mm -hmm. in a place that's mm -hmm. comfortable mm -hmm. and, and safe. And mm -hmm. so religious organizations mm -hmm. are a good connector. Yes. Very good connector. Um, one of the other things listed on your services is safety services. Mm. Can you talk more about mm -hmm. that? Well, the safety services goes uh, quite a ways, but one of the things is our Medical Alert Safe Return program. And people can call and um, become a member of that, become a part of that. And what that will do is if someone is lost and they're wearing a bracelet or a necklace, their name will be on it and the phone number to the Medical Alert Safe Return Program. And then we will talk to the family and find out if they would like for us to help in finding this individual. And so we can do things that um, the family may not be able to do themselves. And most of that is, um, you know, checking with hospitals, um, maybe even putting the person's picture on television, uh, talking to you here at the radio station to send out some type of alert. Um, so we. I strongly urge people to, you know, a lot of people say, oh, she's not going to walk away or he's not going to get lost, mm -hmm. but people do. 
because they, in their mind, they're trying to maybe go home, wherever home would be for them. Uh, they just want to, you know, go to the store, and they don't realize that even though the store is only a few blocks away, that unfortunately they get lost. So it's important that people uh, think about that and uh, be a part of the Medical Alert Safe Return program. Then there are the other safety measures is that we do training with uh, the police. We do training with um, uh, ambulance people who are on the ambul ambulances and things like that so that they're aware of what to look for and that this person could uh, not, they may not be mentally ill, they may have Alzheimer's. They may not be on drugs, they may have Alzheimer's. So we want people to be aware of when they see people and uh, they're not, uh, their behavior is a little inappropriate, then, you know, to think about the fact that this person may have Alzheimer's. Yeah, that's really important uh, because if you come across someone who maybe is not complying or saying confusing things mm -hmm. or not answering questions, um, it might be something else. It's mm -hmm. not that they're just not wanting mm -hmm. to speak to authorities, exactly. but they're not capable of doing so because right. of the condition. Yes, very true. Yes, by getting that um, education on dementia, Alzheimer's, you're better equipped how to handle in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, and this training can go for everybody, like caregivers, same with you know law enforcement or community members. Mm -hmm. Um, so you all raise money as well, <laughs> in addition to advocating mm -hmm. uh, for uh, budgetary allocations, mm -hmm. you also engage in a lot of fundraising activities. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you tell our viewers and listeners mm -hmm. uh, some of the fundraising things that you do here locally? Well, the biggest thing for us is our walks. Uh, which will start in September mm -hmm. and uh, our chapter has about seven walks in Delaware, uh, Southern Jersey and Southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and with the walk is we'd like families to join us or friends to join us and have their own team and to help us raise money and again the majority of that money will go toward research. But the walks are a lot of fun um, because again it, it's bringing people together so that they can raise money together. Uh, we just went through our the longest day which was in June and that's a different type of fundraising where people can do whatever it is that you would like to do and people come up with very creative ways of raising money. They may have a uh, type of uh, barbecue. And, a bake and, sale, uh, mm -hmm. make jewelry mm -hmm. to sell, anything. Very yeah. creative people. <laughs> yeah. And so that way, you know, again, uh, you know, the money is, it comes in and it is shared across uh, the line as far as, you know, research and, and um, uh, some administrative costs, but the majority of the money goes toward, toward research. Our walk this year will be November 11th here in Philadelphia. And where are you walking? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be at Citizens Bank Park, okay. uh, which is uh, where the Phillies play. Uh, we also actually have an outing with the Phillies on uh, August the 10th. And you can go to our website and find out more about that. We hope you will join us there uh, with the Phillies. And we do that on annually. But um, the Philadelphia Walk, as Cynthia said, is uh, Saturday, uh, November the 11th at Citizens Bank Park. It starts somewhere around 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 9.30. And so we're hoping to, again, be the number one chapter. We were the number one chapter as far as numbers of people and uh, the fact that we raised, um, I think it was 1.4 million. And so we're very, very excited about that. And uh, walks are held all across the country. Mm -hmm. All of the chapters do walks. So um, it's really great to be part of the Delaware Valley chapter and, and our walk. But we want everyone mm -hmm. to join us and, and to come out and uh, to be a part of it, especially uh, families that um, have someone that they're caring for. And we have listeners in South Jersey, so if you want to join South Jersey Walks, there's one in Atlantic City, mm -hmm. October 8th. Mm -hmm. and right on the boardwalk. <laughs> Cumberland County, October 14th. Yes. Oh, it's a boardwalk. Yes, at the <laughs> boardwalk in Atlantic City. Start yeah. walks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds yes. good. So how does one do a walk? You have to sign up on the website and get a team together? Yes, that's 
Excellent. You can come join us then. <laughs> uh, yes, you just go to the website or you can call our 800 number, 800. 272-3900 and you know we'd be glad to tell you all about it. Uh, we encourage people who've walked with us before to continue mm -hmm. to walk with us uh, but we love having new teams, new members and if you're you know, not going to do a team uh, it's fine. You can do it individually. Uh, the best thing of course is to sign up now uh, even though the walk isn't until November but we know that especially if you're a team it's best to sign up now and again it's just going to our website or calling us on the phone. Uh, we can send you a packet of information about how to be a team leader. Uh, we can also make suggestions on how you can earn in the money. And we can also um, help you just to understand what it's all about, where your money will go, um, how do you get the t-shirt, uh, because not everybody's given a t-shirt. You've got to earn the t-shirt. Even <laughs> yes. we have to earn the t-shirt. So, uh, so, but it's a lot of fun, and uh, we meet a lot of great people uh, at our walk. Uh, we have maybe 10, 15,000 people that come to the Philly Walk. That's really great um, because, you know, if you start now, mm -hmm. then it'll probably be a little easier for someone to raise money That's right. if they have a couple months to yeah. ask people and yeah. organize their friends. That's true. That's very true. In fact, you know, uh, talking about research, mm -hmm. as we look at the research of walks, we know that people who um, sign up early, as you just said, they do raise more money and it, they be, it's enjoyable and they can do it on an annual basis because they learn how to do it and they know, okay, we've got to get started. And sometimes, you know, we have the um, honor actually of talking to people prior to giving them a call, thanking them for what they did last year, talking to them about, you know, what they're going to do this year, helping them out, sending them incentives, you know, mm -hmm. um, bracelets and things like that that they can use to help to raise money for their team. And they have such wonderful team names and they wear mm -hmm. their own t-shirts with uh, the picture of the person on them. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's a really great day. And even though we're, we're kind of working the walks, but it's really very enjoyable and we get to see certain people, you get to see them every year. So can people volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association? Yes, mm -hmm. we are actually l recruiting for volunteers. To, in putting this huge event, you know, we couldn't do it without our great volunteers. So um, if you're interested, give us a call on the helpline and most definitely we will take you mm -hmm. <laughs> to help us out. Yes. Volunteers are critical, I think. Yes. That. Not only for the walk, but um, for doing a lot of things with us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at people who really want to get involved and really want to do something, maybe even lead a certain area, uh, a, a certain particular task or something. So we're looking for really um, great people who want to take the time and be a leader in this area of volunteerism. But again, the walk is critical. And Elaine Griffin will be just so happy to talk to you about being a volunteer for the walk. And as Cynthia said, all you have to do is go to our website. There's a section for volunteers. You'll fill out the information, and then you'll get a call from Elaine. And also other organizations that are community-based can also provide information mm -hmm. um, if they're not already connected with you. They yes. can sort of start facilitating these, this outreach that you're doing. And definitely. If, um, I guess if you're not able to walk, you can most definitely help out in any way. Becoming an educator, volunteer that day of, mm -hmm. you could donate to, for the cause. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there's mm -hmm. a way you can help. Yes, yeah. many ways to plug yes. in. Mm -hmm. Again, we're speaking with Frederica Wall and Cynthia Solis. They are both representatives of the Delaware Valley chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And we've been talking about their great organization, all the resources that they provide, all the money that they raise, mm -hmm. and trying to educate all of you on, on the disease and what can be done to prevent and, and treat it. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about before we end? <laughs> well, there is one other thing that we could mention is that's the, um, the fact that there are opportunities for people to get involved in research. Uh, on our website, again, they can go to Trial Match, mm -hmm. and Trial Match will tell them about research that's being done, where it's being done, and how a person can get involved. So, and as far as the African American and Latino community, mm -hmm. we really do need people to be involved in research, because if there are any differences 
uh, that's where it will come up and that's where we will understand and know what the needs are of different cultures and different ethnicities. So again, give us a call at 1-800-272-3900 and ask us about Trial Match or simply go on our website, which is alz.org forward slash D-E-L-V-A-L for DelVal. Great. And how can our viewers or people who are interested in collaborating with you, especially in your diversity and inclusion initiative, are they able to email you? Yes, they are. Uh, they can, again, go to the website. The email addresses are all there. And it's very easy. First initial, which is for me, is F for Frederica, last name, W-A-U-G-H at A-L-Z dot org. And all of our staff mm -hmm. are the same way. First initial, um, then the last name, ALZ dot org. Like mine would be C Solis, S O L I S, at ALZ dot org. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I want to thank you both for coming on our show and sharing thank this you. really important information for our communities. Mm -hmm. We hope that you will engage the Alzheimer's Association by either volunteering, uh, learning more about fundraising opportunities, or taking part in their education and outreach activities. Mm -hmm. And again, look out for their walk in Philadelphia, November 11th, and their night out at the Phillies on August 10th. And if you'd like to watch this episode, we will post it on our website at phillycam.org. Next week, the youth are going to take over the People Power Lunch Hour. Mm -hmm. So they're going to do a whole show hosted by teens here in Philadelphia. We hope you'll join us for that conversation. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, and I want to thank you all for listening and watching to the People Power Lunch Hour here on Philly Cam TV. The People Power Lunch Hour is a production of Philly Cam. If you'd like to watch past episodes or be a guest on the People Power Lunch Hour, please visit our website at phillycam.org for more information. We're here every Wednesday from 12 to 1 p.m. on WPPM 106.5 FM and Philly Cam TV on Comcast and Verizon. Please stay tuned. Sprouts is up next. Thanks for listening.